Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, so this is going to be a very interesting and uh, unique uh, research conference. It uh, works off a little bit of the great work of Morel and others, uh, Rob and Matt, um, who put together these conferences that we hold on a routine basis uh, with in DC with the regulatory agencies, the Food and Drug Administration, CMS, uh, NIH, etc as well as with industry and as well as other academic partners around the world, and looks at various topics. Uh, one of these topics that we had in a research conference now held on this concept is the idea of cardiovascular drug development in the US. Is it dead or just hibernating? Uh, the title, you'd be surprised to know, comes from that guy, Caliph, who tends to be uh, provocative in everything that he starts it out with. But the actual meeting was a remarkable opportunity to sort of see where the world is and where it potentially is going. Uh, and I won't steal any more of the thunder of the group here. Um, Matt, you all know, is a, a leader in our mega trials group and a world leading uh, cardiovascular researcher. I won't tell you more about him. Uh, but I will spend just one minute on Chris's uh, CV, which was rem remarkably impressive. It's kind of frightening now as an old person, you look back and you see that there's no chance you would have competed with the people who are coming through the pipeline as we go forward. But uh, Chris is really reads as a who's who of uh, institutions. Uh, Queen's University for an undergrad uh, in Canada, University of Toronto, uh, McGill University uh, for his MD, uh, then uh, Harvard, Duke, and uh, his residency training uh, or in fellowships sort of at British Columbia. He's spending a, a year or a couple, two or three years with us, I guess, uh, one more year with us still, uh, getting uh, more research training before headed back to British Columbia, where he will certainly, most certainly be an international leader in research. So we're quite honored to have him here. Uh, quiet when he first came, but uh, he sat at this meeting and diligently took mo notes and said, sure, I'll have no problem summarizing what all the great thoughts were put down. But his uh, first draft was amazingly close to uh, capturing those very good ideas and maybe improving on a few of them. Um, so we were uh, honored and ple pleasure to have you along and looking forward to the presentation. I'll turn it over to Matt first to say a few words. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I think it's also really important to recognize Morel Mulbert, who really is the key to having these uh, meetings be successful, organizing them, implementing them, and, and helping us throughout the whole process. So Morel, we really appreciate all your help and effort with this. Uh, you're amazing in that regard. And um, other people here from our communications group have helped with the manuscript that was submitted last week, so it's under review right now. And um, it really takes a team effort. Um, Chris has been a great addition to our fellowship program. I've had the opportunity to mentor him since he arrived, and um, it's been really great. We actually called him into duty for this uh, 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 for this activity a few days before it happened because uh, Tarek Ahmad, who was slated to do this, had an injury and wasn't able to attend. And he's been involved as well, and given his input, and Chris leapt at the chance and had done a great job and made a lot of connections at the meeting. So we'll have ample time for question and answer and discussion afterwards, and we'll leave it to Chris now to summarize what we talked about. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Eric and Matt, for that kind introduction. Um, I was a little quiet at the meeting. I was trying to be cautious. I didn't really know who these people were. So I was just um, you know, um, doing my due diligence. So it's my absolute pleasure to be presenting uh, on a topic that I think is dear to the hearts of many of you and, uh, and certainly many of us in this institution um, and in this field. Um, and yes, the title is from Dr. Califf and is meant to be provocative. So uh, my whole role really is to be provocative uh, for the next 30 minutes and then hopefully to generate um, some discussion uh, amongst the group here. So I have no disclosures. So the Gusto trial was uh, published in uh, 1993. And as uh, many of you probably know, it was comparing uh, streptokinase with TPA on a background of uh, heparin um, in the setting of acute MI. And um, it was an important trial for many reasons. Um, it was one of the first mega trials enrolling over uh, 40,000 patients. And certainly um, uh, the findings um, uh, demonstrating the superiority of TPA over streptokinase have implications at that time, but continue to have implications in terms of how we treat many patients uh, globally. Um, but I think um, when you uh, look at the trial itself, uh, there's some other interesting implications with respect to CV drug development. Um, here's a snapshot of a paragraph describing uh, this uh, so-called coordinating center at Duke University at the time. Um, and um, this coordinating center included uh, several uh, members of uh, the DCRI currently. 
And um, the background, as I understand it, is that um, this coordinating center, in addition to, uh, with, with this, with cl while collaborating with Genentech, which, w as I understand it, was a struggling pharmaceutical company, or was at least trying to enter the, the CV market, um, it was through this collaboration that brought both of these institutions um, uh, together uh, to really create what uh, the, the DCRI is today. And I believe that the, uh, the current building that we're currently in was really uh, founded on the success of, uh, and collaboration of this clinical trial. And so there are important uh, implications for CV drug development, certainly at this institution, um, but uh, for many. And so this is the preamble uh, I'm showing you by Dr. Califf, the preamble to this entire uh, think tank. And basically uh, what it states is that um, uh, we have a resulting standoff uh, in, drug, in investment in CV drug development as a result of the fact that industry investors think that um, measuring the risk benefit with real trials, large trials, is too expensive. And regulators in this country and elsewhere are leery of shortcuts. But we know that CV disease is growing globally. Um, we believe that the science is strong and may need some refinement, but we need a case for reshaping um, early phase development. Uh, we need to be doing outcome studies uh, much less expensively uh, so that we get a fair price for effective CV medications. So born out of this uh, was, as uh, Matt and Eric described, the CV drug development the think tank that was uh, led by DCRI uh, outside of uh, Washington, D.C. Um, in July and had the privilege to attend. Along with Drs. Califf, Peterson Rowe, uh, Tariq Ahmed was involved as well, as you know, and Morel uh, Mulbert from this institution. Uh, but there were several leaders uh, from academia, um, industry, as well as government, including uh, those from the FDA, CMS, and NIH, that sat down to really think about um, what is going on with CV drug development, and uh, are, what are the problems, and what should we be doing about them? So these were the clear objectives. So um, there are three objectives. So one, uh, delineate the current trends in CV drug development. Two, understand the key issues that underlie these trends. Uh, three, provide potential uh, solutions to these problems. So this is a graphic that probably many, as, many of us have seen dozens of times in our training. Um, as we pat ourselves on the back um, because, you know, we've done a great job in reducing the age-adjusted death rate in the United States over the last several decades uh, to the point now where we're actually uh, tying cancer. Um, and so things are looking fairly good. And we can explain uh, the decrease in deaths from uh, coronary artery disease uh, to both treatments and uh, risk factor changes. And so this graphic is showing you uh, the results of several studies which have tried to determine an etiology for the reduction in death from coronary artery disease uh, to other treatments or uh, risk factors. And what you can see from this most recent study, which, is, which was published uh, now seven or eight years ago, that about half of the reduction in CV death is due to drug treatment. So we seem to be doing a good job, and drug treatments seem to be helping. But that's not entirely true. So let's step back from the United States and perhaps some other westernized countries. And what we're seeing is that, um, in fact, CV, uh, CV, cardiovascular disease, as well as other chronic diseases, are becoming uh, the major player in terms of um, the global burden of disease. And so there's been a dramatic shift in deaths from younger uh, to older patients and from communi commun communicable to non-communicable -commun uh, diseases. So that death from CV disease is really becoming a function of, uh, of your wealth and income in several of the countries um, around the world. So we do have a major unmet uh, need uh, for uh, improving cardiovascular outcomes. And so we would think that, well, we must be uh, doing pretty well in terms of cardiovascular drug development, or that's implicitly thought of uh, to be the case. But um, our, I'm going to show you some evidence now that, that uh, we should be actually quite concerned with what's going on in CV drug development. So the FDA shared um, some of its uh, data on uh, marketing applications and several and other applications to their division of CV and renal drugs. And um, what this shows is um, clearly that there's been a decline in, uh, in marketing applications over the last decade uh, for both new uses, so these are drugs that have previously been approved, or new molecular entities. These would be new drugs uh, being approved for the first time. So a clear reduction or decrease in marketing applications. Furthermore, if we look at um, investigal new drug applications over time, whether for research, peer research, or uh, for the purposes of uh, commercial use, which would end up being uh, for, mar for marketing, um, we see um, perhaps a plateauing or perhaps even a reduction uh, in applications um, over the last uh, couple of decades. And again, this is in context of the growing 
unmet need of cardiovascular disease. But you don't need to, uh, you know, speak to the FDA really to see what's actually happening. So this is a, a, a figure that I adapted from David DeMetz from University of Wisconsin. Um, and basically all he did was just search clinicaltrials.gov looking for uh, trials over the last decade uh, with a drug and a clinical outcome. And whether you look at um, phase three trials or all trials, um, what you see is that cardiovascular disease um, sits dwarfed uh, by cancer. And um, I believe this, is, you know, this has been an ongoing issue and supported by uh, some more empirical evidence. So if we look at trends in development uh, comparing the 90s to the 2000s, uh, what we see is that across all therapeutic areas, um, oncology drugs grew the most annually, about 7%. Um, whereas CV, CV drugs uh, experience the strongest contraction in any therapeutic area, uh, about 5% per year. Um, furthermore, if we look at success rates uh, for oncology drugs, they had the most applications and the highest uh, rate of first cycle FDA approvals at 72%. In contrast, CV drugs had significantly fewer applications, but also a much lower rate of approval. This figure is actually quite telling. So this looks at compounds and development by therapeutic class across the phases. And each of the line represents a specific therapeutic area. And I'll draw your attention to the green asterisk and the green line, which is cardiovascular disease. So despite our unmet need in cardiovascular disease, we have essentially a flattening of compounds and development. There's been no increase at all. Um, and I think also strikingly is the fact that if we look at other therapeutic areas, particularly cancer, uh, which is highlighted um, here in the, which I'll highlight here in the, the light blue, we see essentially almost a logarithmic increase in the number of compounds in development over the last 10 years. So there's clearly been a, um, uh, a uh, plateauing or a reduction in terms of uh, what's in the pipeline in terms of CV drug development. And so the question is why? So this slide looks at um, overall pharmaceutical, uh, what I call uh, efficiency, over the last um, several decades. And this encompasses all uh, pharmaceutical R&D. And so what you see here in the blue line are um, the number of new drug approvals um, over time. And concomitantly, there's also the, uh, in the, with the red line and the blue shading underneath over here, we see um, R&D investment. And so what we see is there's, there's increasing, there, increasingly there are uh, newer drugs being approved until about 1998 um, when there's an inflection point. And in fact, as investment continues to rise, um, there's a reduction in actually new drug approval. So over time, the industry as a whole has become uh, far less efficient in churning out drugs. When we look at uh, trends in clinical trial complexity, we also see some adverse um, adverse signals. So whether you look at, um, there, and there's several parameters here to the left side of the table uh, which are, are looking at complexity, but if you look at total procedures per trial, uh, work burden, eligibility criteria, clinical trial treatment period, or my favorite case report forms, over a five-year over a five-year period you see a dramatic increase in, uh, in complexity um, across all clinical trials. Um, so this is actually uh, quite concerning. And some of the uh, complexity certainly has to do with uh, regulatory uh, review and this notion of uh, regulatory uncertainty, which concerns investors. And uh, the one way to think about this, which was brought up by one of the meeting participants um, from industry, is basically to think of two drugs. So there's one drug that uh, perhaps like an antihypertensive or uh, a lipid treatment, which could follow a known regulatory pathway uh, because there has been some precedent. And there potentially is a predictable time to drug development. Um, or there's a novel drug uh, which uh, could follow an ill-defined regulatory pathway, um, which uh, then results in on an ongoing discussion with regulators and increased time to drug development, and in, in fact more risk for the investor and potentially less uh, return on investment. So regulatory review can sometimes be an unpredictable um, 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 uh, part of the drug approval process. We're also seeing a globalization of clinical trials, which adds to the complexity and cost. So in the last decade, there's been a clear shift in the distribution of FDA-regulated site investors, such that um, there's an annual 15% increase in non-US-based investigators, whereas there's been a consistent 5% decrease in uh, US-based um, investigators. 
there are some, several reasons why we're going global. We know that 90%, 96% of the world's population lives globally, um, but it's quite clear that uh, it's, we're having more difficulty recruiting uh, in Western countries. And there's several reasons for this, which are beyond uh, the current discussion, but that is quite clear. Um, furthermore, um, as we're going global, uh, several of these uh, in, uh, industry um, leaders are, are telling us that you know, um, the other regulatory bodies, such as the Europeans Medicine Agency, uh, have their own complex issues. In fact, the EMA is a decentralized organization, and while there have been some um, efforts to try and centralize uh, policies, um, it's still decentralized and many countries have their own IRBs, and so this becomes even more complex when you think about it. But the, um, the overall feeling from the meeting is that um, um, the move to go global is largely as a result of um, 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 bureaucratic and uh, you know, complexity uh, amongst uh, many Western countries, which has led to uh, more costs and more, and more um, effort on the part of the sponsor. So I've told you about how much it costs. I've told you about the complexity of, um, of these trials. Um, but we need to think about incentives. And so what types of incentives are um, do you potentially sponsors, uh, what, are they what could they potentially receive or those in interested in drug development, um, and what has been going on over time? And so when you think of incentives, you think of push mechanisms and pull mechanisms. So push mechanisms would be those incentives uh, that help um, um, uh, help with the R&D, help provide support for the R&D uh, portion of drug development, and pull mechanisms uh, would result in um, you know, helping uh, market uh, the product or, or bringing drugs to market once they reach that stage. So what are some important push mechanisms or push incentives? So the first is NIH. So what you see here is, again, a chart we've probably seen dozens of times, but really that the overall NIH funding um, has been increasing and then somewhat plateauing over the latter part of the 2000s. But if we look a little bit more closely into the NIH budget and, um, what, um, and the institutes that are actually involved within the NIH and what type of money that they're receiving, we see here that the NCI, or the National Cancer, Cancer Institute, received $4.8 billion. Uh, comparatively, the NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, received $2.9 billion in 2013. So in 2013, the NCI is certainly receiving more money uh, than the NHLBI. Um, but this pattern has been going on for the last 35 years. And so I'm just highlighting, um, you know, each of these dots represents one of the institutes. And what you can see here is that, on, on, you know, that the NCI has been leading um, in terms of uh, funding uh, from the NIH over the last 35 years. So on the y-axis, we have funding in 2010. On the x-axis, we have funding in 1980. And um, you know, this is in large part due to the war on cancer, which was declared by Nixon. Um, but certainly over the last 35 years, more money has been shifted, has been going towards oncology. What about some other push mechanisms? So the FDA itself has um, several special designation um, approval uh, pathways um, that help facilitate uh, and improve efficiency of uh, uh, drug, uh, drug <coughs> approval. And so I've highlighted two um, of these approval uh, uh, pathways. Um, certainly one of them is orphan drugs, so this would be for rare diseases. But what you can see is whether it's orphan drugs or accelerated approvals, um, and accelerated approvals are for um, approving drugs on the, ba on the basis of surrogate endpoints, and it was really um, um, initiated during the time of AZT therapy when HIV was widespread and there was felt to be a, a real need to, to get these drugs out to the market. But what you can see in both cases, um, cancer dominates these uh, special designation approval pathways, and cardiovascular uh, disease uh, is, is certainly uh, takes up a much smaller portion. So even at the FDA level, uh, we're dealing with um, a lack of um, um, uh, efficiency um, because we cannot access uh, these, some of these special designation programs. So what about other push mechanisms? What about advocacy and fundraising? Um, well, we're seeing a similar pattern. So let me draw your attention to the left side of the screen when we look at charitable donations. So if you look simply at charitable donations in 2011 uh, for the Komen Race for the Cure or the Movember prostate cancer uh, fundraising, fundraising campaign, it's about eight times the amount of money uh, that was raised by the Jump Roll for Heart campaign. And in 2010, um, the American Cancer Society raised probably tw uh, about twice as much as the AHA. I like this infographic here, um, which was uh, taken from Vox.com, and I think was probably on your Facebook page. Uh, but um, what it really shows is where we donate and the diseases that kill us, and I think it really depicts it nicely. So um, in the pink over here, we see breast cancer and the amount that it raises, uh, but you know, only, only quote-unquote, 40,000 40, patients uh, die yearly from breast cancer. In contrast, if we look at cardiovascular disease, this is the AHA Jump Rope for Heart campaign, and we see clearly that uh, there's a discord here. 
Um, and then you can look at other, um, uh, certainly other measures of fundraising, including crowdfunding, which is, uh, you know, raising uh, small amounts of uh, money, uh, through, usually through the internet, and that's also dominated uh, by, uh, by oncology. So the question is, why are, we, uh, why are we doing this? I mean, these are the diseases that kill us. Why do we continue to donate uh, disproportionately? And, you know, clearly it's fear uh, that drives fundraising success. So a recent MetLife survey uh, found that 41% uh, of respondents feared cancer as, as a disease they feared, or named cancer as a disease that they feared the most, and not heart disease. Um, only 8% named heart disease or stroke. Um, and a recent survey of women uh, despite you know heart disease being the number one killer in women, um, the survey found that it was actually cancer that was to believe to be the sex's number one uh, uh, cause of death. And so um, you know the discussion at the meeting was you know maybe what we're doing is you know uh, by or through our successes we're actually turning um, you know coronary disease, valvular disease, and other cardiovascular diseases into more chronic conditions that might be perceptibly less threatening. And so people are less scared of cardiovascular disease in general. Let's talk about investment in terms of uh, biotech investment and venture capital. Uh, again, more adverse trends. So if we look at uh, the number of products partnered for development or companies that outlicense product uh, by therapeutic area, again, what we see is that cardiovascular disease um, is trailing several other therapeutic areas, um, including oncology, which of course remains um, at the top. And so maybe what, what, what's really happening is maybe we are a victim of our own success. Um, in some ways, you know, payers, patients, physicians demand large outcomes trials. Um, and as a result, um, you know, what's happening is that um, the incremental benefit on top of standard of care for each of these trials is just becoming more and more challenging. And this is sort of a classic graph looking at LDL and how it relates to event rates. And as uh, more and more trials came on board uh, with LDL, you know, now we're looking at how low can we go and how can we reduce that event rate. It was obvious, it's obviously a lot harder with TNT, uh, potentially Jupiter, uh, compared to 4S. So you know, this is sort of um, something that we may, may, we may have created on our own. I think the most telling reason for, for drug failure is, is probably shown in this graph here from, and this is taken from um, the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, and they're very active in this, um, this, this space. And what it shows is by therapeutic area, um, the reasons for drug failure, and I'll uh, draw your attention to cardiovascular, uh, the cardiovascular uh, graph here, and what you see is um, efficacy, safety, and commercial viability. And the number one reason that a cardiovascular, potential cardiovascular therapy does not make it through the development process is not because it's not efficacious or not because it's considered unsafe. It's because it's considered commercially um, unviable. And what does it mean to be commercially unviable? Well, um, this is either that the company, there's, a, there's an expected, you know, the costs are rising or revenues may fall, there's competition, um, or the firm potentially abandons the area for strategic reasons. So I think this is actually very, potentially quite concerning. We think about why drugs are not getting through the development process. And of course, I talked about us being a victim of our own success here in the cardiovascular arena. So should, maybe we should be thinking about uh, surrogate endpoints. I mean, are these a good option? I mean, theoretically, um, we can bring uh, some of these drugs uh, to close, you know, earlier uh, uh, to market at a lower cost, and this potentially is appealing uh, to several um, stakeholders. And we know in cardiovascular disease that uh, you know, we do have some valid surrogate endpoints. Um, for example, blood pressure and LDL. Uh, but I want to highlight the fact that uh, these endpoints have been validated, but only after study in multiple randomized clinical trials, as well as meta-analyses involving tens and tens of thousands of patients. So yes, these are valid surrogate endpoints, um, but only after sufficient study. But I'd like to remind the group that we've also come across several uh, agents that have caused harm. And these are agents that have initially met surrogate endpoints, but we didn't stop there. We looked for outcomes. And, you know, alpha adrenergic blockers, torcetrapib, um, niacin, inotropes, and shock, class 1C antiarrhythmics. These are just, this is the selection of, of drugs that actually caused harm uh, following, uh, after having initially met surrogate endpoints. So um, the feeling from the group is that, yes, we are perhaps a victim of our own success in some ways, that we d demand large outcomes trials, but we cannot rely on surrogate outcomes on their own. This is a telling table, I think, looking at the efficacy trials that support FDA approval 
of novel therapeutic agents. And I'd like everybody to look sort of carefully here. And it's been, you know, each row represents a therapeutic group. So let me start with um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. What we see here is that these, these trials um, expectantly were, were, were um, the largest. They were of the longest duration. And the majority of these uh, trials were randomized, double-blinded, and had a placebo or active comparator arm. If we look at oncology, what we find is that these are smaller trials of a lower uh, duration, uh, of, uh, lo um, of um, less length, but only half of them are randomized. Only half of them had a placebo or active control comparator, and only 25% of them were double-blinded. And these were trials that supported approval of drugs. So to me, this was, this was quite surprising and clearly shows that there's, there are different bars in terms of uh, obtaining FDA approval in general. And they vary widely by field, although I'll point out that um, you know, several of the other therapeutic fields uh, were similar to cardiology in terms of the trials that supported drug approval. So then, now that I've painted a pretty uh, um, uh, poor picture of cardiovascular drug development and, um, and potentially our futures and our jobs, um, um, maybe we should think about, you know, what are some strategies or how do, how do we, and I'd like, this is the discussion that we'd like to have after I'm finished with this, is, you know, we're looking for ideas now and to um, continue the discourse. So again, I want to remind you um, about a typical clinical trial in 2012. So 13 endpoints, my favorite 169 case report forms, pages, and you're asking study volunteers to make 11 visits over an average of 175 days. So clearly, um, clearly quite a lot of burden. And so um, those at this institution, including uh, Zubin Epin and others, have really published on the fact that despite um, uh, these large trials, we still need to think about um, barriers uh, to conducting trials. And so um, some of the um, things that, we can, that, that were brought up at the, some of the issues that were brought up at the meeting and some of the suggestions are included here. So how do we increase trial efficiency? Um, so first was that we need a uh, clear plan early uh, amongst industry leaders, academics, and others involved in the trial to meet with the regulators and think about these case report forms and think about omitting the collection of unessential data up front and how this should be prioritized. We need to be thinking about quality by design. I'll speak a little bit more about that. But this is a, this is a prerogative that's been met in several other industries, including the automotive industry, to think about continuous QI and the evaluation of your product, uh, think about who your, your, who, who, who the pro to whom the product is being intended for, and there are several principles there. Um, we should think about centralizing IRBs. Why do we need IRBs in, at every single site? I mean, that's, that seems like a, uh, like a waste of time and resources. And I, I, I understand there are complexities, particularly in global trials, but we need to think about centralizing the IRBs. We should be focusing on, um, on SUSAR and limiting our uh, adverse event uh, reporting in general and to those uh, adverse events which we think are particularly important. We should think about centralizing mon uh, centralized monitoring practice as well as risk-based monitoring. And this is, um, guidance, this is also consistent with guidance provided by the FDA, you know, focusing on sites that are higher risk, potentially, um, and, and focusing less on sites um, that, are not, um, that, are, that, are, that are meeting expectations. And so um, an initiative that ha encompasses many of these suggestions is the, is the city group. Um, and the city group is actually conceived here at Duke, but is, is, a, is in partnership with um, uh, is a public-private uh, partnership which looks to improve uh, the clinical science of you know clinical trials operations, and uh, this is an example of uh, how they uh, they're trying to educate others on uh, quality by design. And so you can you can you know log into a webinar series and learn more about quality by design. Um, but the, this is a great um, I think initiative to try and uh, improve the efficiency of clinical trials um, as a whole. So um, this is a, you know this should be leveraged definitely. Other strategies. So there's a tendency uh, to use phase two studies to try and predict outcomes. Um, and we need to remind ourselves that we should not be thinking about phase two studies as outcome, as outcome studies, but really focusing on refining the variables um, um, such as dosing, PKPD studies, side effects, biomarkers. I mean, we should be really using them to plan for the phase three studies to give us the best chance that that potential therapeutic uh, will be successful in the phase three study. So there was discussion on, you know, let's focus on what a phase two study should be, uh, was meant for originally and not to focus on outcomes in phase two. We should be thinking about other trial designs um, one of them would be an adaptive design. So this would be a, a, a trial design where you would have potentially pre-specified updates up front depending on how the trial is going. 
So for example, um, should, should we you know, pre-specified updates and think about reducing or increasing sample size, study duration, if the trial is clearly um, uh, not showing an impact? Um, think about um, even uh, removing study arms um, potentially, um, or uh, refining dosing as the study go as 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 the study is ongoing, uh, as well as prioritize study endpoints. So you know, see the endpoints that are having an impact, potentially modifying them throughout the course of the trial. All of this would be pre-specified, uh, but the idea is that this would increase study viability and decrease investor risk. And um, the FDA is certainly. Um, concerned about adaptive design because most of this is unproven, um, but I think uh, that we need to be open to uh, adaptive design as a possibility. There's, there's a significant discussion on, on the valley of death, and this is the valley uh, from phase one to phase three where several of these uh, uh, you know, early um, you know, bench um, therapeutics um, sort of die. And, um, the question is, what do we do about this? And so uh, the NIH has uh, stepped forward and uh, is, is, is hoping to act as a bridge to help translate some of these um, uh, therapeutics. Um, so they have several early uh, pro uh, support programs that support early phase development. Uh, there is the Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, uh, but specifically within the NHLBI, um, there is the Center for Accelerated Innovation, which is focused on com the commercialization, product development of basic science. There's the Vita Group, uh, which promotes uh, neglected therapies and diagnostics, which you know in can include could include pulmonary hypertension, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and we all know that scientists and physicians are notoriously terrible uh, with finances. So there's the uh, small business innovation research, uh, which could provide potentially seed funding uh, to uh, scientists who are trying to uh, bring their drugs to market. And basically this is a graphic showing that um, from basic research and discovery to commercialization, there are several uh, mechanisms within the NHLBI and the NIH uh, that could potentially be leveraged to help uh, bring these drugs um, to commercialization. There was a strong feeling at the meeting uh, that we should continue to leverage academic experts and institutions such as DCRI to act as an interface between industry and regulators. I believe, and, and many believe, that we here at the DCRI and at other AROs and other academics uh, understand the science of clinical operations. We understand trial methodology, um, IP, tech transfer. We understand, um, as many of us are clinicians, uh, what the unmet clinical needs are. And we can bring this back to um, the research agenda. We can mentor the next generation of researchers. Um, and there are certain practical operational uh, things that, that we are expert at, including contracts, IRB approvals, uh, site management, um, committees, publications. But above all, um, academics and AROs provide a credible infrastructure uh, for academic industry and regulator uh, interactions. We need to continue to strengthen the science. Um, there's no easy way to do this, but you know, certainly the nomenclature of CV disease um, I think is an impediment to, some, so to, to, to drug approval. You know, we think of something like heart failure, where we treat half the patients with heart failure with the same drugs, but it's pro there are probably hundreds of pathophysiological mechanisms that underlie heart failure. So we need to think about refining the nomenclature and understanding the biology. We need to use biomarkers not as surrogate endpoints but to form enriched populations and help further classify disease. Um, an example of this was you know, a companion trial when we looked at CRT in the setting of heart failure. Well, they only included patients with a QRS greater than 130 because it enriched the population, or Jupiter, where we concluded a CRP of greater than two. And the thought is that if you would have included an entire population of, say, heart failure, you probably wouldn't have shown benefit. So when you think about using these biomarkers and perhaps in phase two studies to help enrich populations um, to improve our outcomes. There's some other novel strategies, so um, we need to think about um, um, perhaps a smaller pre-marketing study that may give temporary approval of a drug, which can then be marketed and then collect the data in a post-marketing study. This continuum study design um, decreases the risk for the investor, um, but we can, st we can still pool data from pre- and post-market registries to, uh, you know, to look at outcomes and other safety uh, indicators. We should continue to think about uh, PCORI and align with their initiatives and think about perhaps comparative effectiveness trials and how we can integrate registries into our trials uh, to improve patient outcomes, um, improve efficiency, and decrease cost. So to summarize, um, I don't believe uh, CV drug development is, is dead, uh, but it's, it's likely hibernating. Um, and we know that CV drug development has declined. 
and that's mostly been driven by uh, financial factors, including the perception that we should be bringing non-CV drugs to market because that's less risky and more profitable. Um, however, we, we do continue uh, to require large outcomes to demonstrate uh, the balance and, and harms of potential therapies. Uh, we should be leveraging academics and novel government programs, enriching our populations in the trials, and using potentially novel operational approaches. And so, uh, to this end, um, uh, and on the basis of this think tank, uh, um, we have, um, and I think this is what, we've submitted a manuscript to really um, engage um, others in, in this arena to um, improve the discourse and, um, you know, sort of, not alarm, but, you know, really demonstrate that this is a problem in CV drug development and we should be thinking about this and not assuming that just because our, there's an unmet burden of disease that there's um, concomitantly, uh, CV, you know, CV drug development is, is trying to meet that. And that's not simply the case. And um, I think this aligns with the DCRI mission to, you know, to develop and share knowledge that improves the care of patients around the world. Thank you very much, and I'd uh, be happy to take questions. So, Chris, is a nice summary. Um, is it... uh, why don't we go ahead with some questions here. If you just speak up, the microphone should pick you up. And if you're having trouble in the back here, just, just let us know. Hey, so it's a really good presentation, and actually this is kind of interesting times um, based on what you guys have discussed of, uh, as part of the roundtables and, and what your paper is going to highlight. Uh, are there three um, points that you should consider making to the new deputy uh, commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> and just remember, this is being recorded. Okay, so, uh, I'm watching, I'm sure. And, and, we can make sure to take the snippet and um, put it out there in the public domain uh, and highlight that. So what, what should the deputy commissioner do for drug advice development? Three things. That's, a, um, that's an important question. I can take one. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, I think first of all, I think it may, you know, it probably comes as a surprise to many people that uh, CV drug development is actually, a pro there's a problem with it, and I don't think that many people realize that as a whole. And so I think the first issue is that we need to talk about this a little more. The second issue is, it's pretty clear to me and perhaps others that what drives, um, what drives this is um, not the unmet burden of disease or the fact that we've cured, you know, cardiovascular disease. It's, it's purely, it's mostly, in many cases, financial. And we rely on, you know, we rely on sponsors and industry to um, develop these medications. Um, but really, you know, they need to be profitable. We need to understand that. We need to work together with them and try and mitigate their risk. Um, and the third thing, I think, is we need to think about uh, trial design a little bit differently and how we can incorporate some of these novel approaches, even though there may be resistance. We need to think about that. I would say to our new deputy commissioner that <coughs> the regulatory uncertainty that most companies face needs to be downgraded quite a bit because even though many in the FDA have published and publicly you know, stated for large simple trials and reducing a lot of the complexity that Chris went through, all the industry partners that we have will tell you that behind closed doors they hear exactly the opposite from the FDA when they're going through their spot process. And I think the FDA needs to stick with their public positions on this and we need to be the ones helping them push them there so that a company has a viable pathway and doesn't get uh, hamstrung along the way by, you know, a rogue medical review, which is one of the biggest concerns. Chris. So, so that was great, Chris. But I'm going to take a little, I'm going to be a contrarian. Okay, may of not course, surprise, we would expect nothing may not surprise you. <laughs> um, but, but I actually, I mean, I actually think the FDA has pretty good mechanisms to substantially simplify and streamline things. And, and a big part of the problem, and I'm wondering if you sense this, Chris, or if even the right people were there, which has always been a challenge of ours, is that there's this kind of like regulatory industrial complex that we all suffer from, including at Duke University, and, but, but, but even more so at some of these big companies. They have huge regulatory um, departments. And their job security depends on leveraging complexity. <laughs> and promote, you know, I, I'm, no, I'm actually not be, I'm being really serious. And, uh, and, and I think the leadership of the company, and they, and they have lawyers who tell them, who's, the lawyer's job is to, is to manage risk, and is to put things in place to assure that risk is minimized. 
And then what happens is it promotes this complexity that's harmful <coughs> to the overall mission of efficiently developing therapies and getting them through the regulatory process. And you know, I know there's different yeah. levels in the FDA, but I do think it's true that that if companies went to the FDA and said, this is my plan, I don't want to collect any AEs uh, that are collected as clinical outcomes, and I just want to you know, give those to you quarterly as through the normal case report form mechanism. I, I want to, you know, I, I want to have a much more limited um, risk-based monitoring approach. I want to substantially reduce the number of AEs that we distribute. All these things that are part of the guidance now, but that, but that we know, even though they're part of the guidance that's been developed over the past five years, that generally is not being used by big pharma um, in these trials. So I don't know how to get it's, it's fundamentally, I think, the leadership of companies has to recalculate this risk uh, calculation to say they're willing to take a little bit more risk and they're willing to streamline things because it will substantially improve their efficiency and that will be more important than the risk issue. I mean, I, I think that's a great point and that's really where I see the academic interface is helping to push this along. And, bring a lot into the public domain. And, you know, I think um, uh, whenever we ask the FDA this in public forums, they always endorse, you know, they say, when am I going to see a large simple trial on a registration pathway? And, you know, when we ask industry this, like I said earlier, they, they tell you, they try to go down that pathway, at least I don't know all the details, and, and then they get stymied when they actually go through some of the more detailed parts of the FDA. So our job is really to push that along, put it in the public domain, such that all parties are then potentially publicly accountable and push that forward for the unmet need for, for patient care. I mean, that's really where I think a lot of that is lost out on what do our patients need and how can we improve their outcomes. Um, so I, I, I agree with you. There is a huge bureaucracy behind some of this. And um, I think that if we just let the industry and the FDA go at each other, we're not going to make any progress. Our job is really to move things forward like we've tried to do here and by publishing the results and bringing up those information in a variety of different public forms, that moves the ball forward, I think. Go ahead. I mean, if there are others, I would also just, I would caution that, that because cancer, that, that because oncology drug development is, um, is kind of easier, is not necessarily good, it's not necess and it's not necessarily a bad reflection on cardiovascular. I mean, people like David Demetz left oncology because he was so frustrated that, I mean, these aren't even clinical trials. A single arm <laughs> clinical trial is not a clinical trial, it's a registry. It's, so I think it the fact that... It was not a Registries are great, just not for drug approval. Um, so, uh, so the fact that, the, that oncology has, um, you know, poor trial designs doesn't mean that that's a problem. We should be proud of that rather than think of yeah. it as a problem in cardiovascular. But it's not just cancer, like, uh, I mean, hepatitis C and others. I mean, the endpoints are just basically virologic clearance, which is, again, you know, they have, they can have single arm studies that way, so there's other areas. So, I mean, what, what the industry tells us is that they're looking for a therapy that may be indicated only for a small portion of the population a policy therapy like a biologic, which is really what people are focusing on right now. But they can get a return on investment because most of that population would potentially get their therapy if their trial with their surrogate outcome is positive. And they're, they're willing to go down that road. And cancer treatment, is really, that's what's changed a lot, is that there are so many different genetic markers and things for cancer to define a certain treatment that's often a biologic. But looking at that is a shorter drug development timeline, earlier return on investment, and less risk. And so, you know, but then that doesn't address you know, the millions of patients like, that Chris talked about and other disease conditions as well. So, again, we have to keep pushing this ball forward, but the key is that we're, that, you know, we're, we're totally have good relationships with all the different parties, and the NIH actually really has changed their footprint, and that was very clear at this meeting of what they're trying to do to help this along, which has never been done before. So, there are a number of people at the NIH now who attended this uh, drug development think tank who previously were in industry and went to the NIH and are leveraging their skill set for the things that Chris talked about. So it's early. Some of these things are incubators that may take some time to develop. But that's encouraging to see what's happening with the NHLBI in that regard and their strong support for large simple trials, which I think will have a filter down effect. Let's see. Marty? 
In addition to the uh, drug development strategies that you outlined, I think you, you're talking about the huge expense for commercializing. And I think one of the biggest differences for pharma is they're going to look at a, an NPV model for what that product's going to bring, bring in. And when you compare the cost to market it to a huge audience like primary care as well as cardiovascular, it throws that NPV right out the window compared to an oncologic. I think we offer a strategy with our CEE in helping lead industry to research to practice strategies that we could then debate on. Uh, I think that's a good point. I mean, um, and that's, uh, the other thing is, is um, you know, Chris talked a lot about drug development, but there's a huge area of research that we're leading, I think, the field in, and what happens after drug gets approved. And, and that's really something we did discuss in this meeting, but through all the implementation research and you know, uh, phase four studies and registries that we're doing to really understand how things are taken in practice. So some of these commercial failures that Chris highlighted that are overrepresented in cardiovascular drug development could be not necessarily due to, to, to drug to failure. It's the fact they didn't really integrate that into practice in a way that would be as uh, smart as possible. So we can help in that regard to give companies a viable pathway post-approval to know that if they have an F efficacious therapy, they get an indication for it, we can help them figure out how they can be best implemented within uh, usual practice as it changes, as well as within practice guidelines as they change. Shelby. I, I would add that another thing that's that's driving the complexity and maybe size and scope of these trials is that a lot of companies are looking beyond FDA approval into how they're going to market the drug. And with increasing kind of scrutiny by payers about comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness, impact on patient safety and all of that, they have to think about generating that evidence earlier and they're putting that in their phase three clinical trials as opposed to waiting to do it in phase four because they want that information <clears throat> upon approval and not down the road. Do you, do you really think that's the case? I mean, I, I'm just curious for other experiences because I think probably some of us feel like that should be the case because, you know, the payers ultimately will have some influence that had not happened. I mean, you're used to that in European markets, but um, not so much in the U.S. So I'd be curious, like, from Chris or Eric or someone else, like, you know, because it almost seems always just the, the um, kind of the goalposts that they're getting to is just an indication. And then, yeah, like, there is some thoughts there, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't always become primary and fully integrated. It's almost a separate kind of work stream that I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not as impressed with the integration. I think it's variable by company. Some, some companies, I think, are very focused on you know, on thinking about how they're going to sell the drug after it's approved, and others are very focused on on the um, just the regulatory approval. And it, you know, and, and a lot of drug development now that we're seeing is is being developed in smaller biotech companies that that then you know that drug gets purchased by the bigger company. And so, you know, a lot of them they don't think about those those longer term um, endpoints about sales. They think about just how do I get this drug purchased by a company, um, and so they're, they're focused on FDA approval. I, I agree with you. In my experience, it's a real battle, because you're talking about dropping, usually dropping a validated instrument into a phase three protocol that's already huge, and clinical doesn't want to do it. Um, so it's really hard to get them to buy into it. So let's try to, to merge two of your comments together to kind of get some consensus. They're really, you're both sort of right. The, 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 the comment that industry absolutely uses, there are some internal calculator to determine the degree to which a trial might generate ultimately more sales absolutely happens. Uh, we were burned by that yesterday. Um, somebody sat down and an actuarial said, you know, if you do this study, even if it comes up positive, here's what our, our value of that return will be on sales, and here's the value if the trial comes in negative, and what's the odds that a trial will be positive and negative, and that becomes the cost relative to the cost of the trial decision point reached, done. That's it. The reality, though, is, um, which gets a little bit to where Marty's comment comes in, I'll tie in that and then Adrian's, Marty's comment that if you actually change the <coughs> equation so that if, in fact, if the trial comes in positive and it shows that this drug actually works, it would get more utilized in routine practice without a huge commercial cost on the other end to get it to be adopted, yes, then the equation absolutely shifts because then there's more value on that side if the study actually comes in. 
um, the comment Adrian brought in about, like, well, do you actually do cost effectiveness analysis up front? That doesn't drive any of this, right? Is that because that would be evidence driving driving these <laughs> decisions downstream? And, and to as of yet, that hasn't been really a strong predictor of actual end up sales. Uh, it may be in the future. It may be that we'll get to a point where we're more European-like in terms of our nice organizations that will drive cost effectiveness decisions. But right now, that there's no real great relationship between cost of therapies, uh, efficacy, and whether they'll be adopted, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I would say just part of the only recent example where they're coming to highlight is hepatitis C, where like actually, you know, PBMs were finally saying, okay, you know, now we have a choice. Uh, we're going to make a, a choice on price, which hadn't really been done before. I'm not sure what you said. Yeah, one of the reasons oncology has been so successful in the last 10 years, 20 years, is that uh, there's been a lot of subtyping of, different, of all the different cancers. And uh, some of it is genetic, and they, they've made tremendous progress in that area. So actually, the, the population that's being treated with a particular drug is actually getting smaller because of all the subtyping that's taking place. The, the thing is, the efficacy has gone up. And so as you, you, you think about this, uh, you know, the companies do make money off of these small populations. And so my question to you, Chris, is, you know, do, do you see, you know, cardiovascular diseases being subtyped as well? I mean, for example, if, if you take that uh, uh, slide that you showed, the, the LDL, that there are there are some patients who, who don't respond and so there must be some underlying mechanism because they still have uh, events and, and so is, is there a, a move or thought to you know start to subtype certain uh, the, the cardiovascular diseases so that it's not all just one kind of disease yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a really great question. So um, I didn't get into this too much detail during this discussion, um, but this was certainly discussed at the meeting. I mean, there was a lot, there was a lot of talk about the nomenclature, and so in, in the paper we talk about how I think the nomenclature of cardiology is probably a disservice because it doesn't really um, it doesn't really you don't really appreciate all the different subtypes of, for example, heart failure. You know, half the patients have <coughs> heart failure; it's diastolic or systolic, but there are numerous pathophysiological you know processes that are happening, and yet we're treating all these processes with, you know, um, you know, a select few medications. So I think there's definitely um, a move towards that, um, and I think that's part of re refining the biology in terms of helping identify <coughs> populations like oncology um, that would benefit from uh, specific, you know, probably targeted therapies. And the same, the same thing in, in, in infectious diseases, where you're targeting an organism, okay, you're not targeting, like, an, an organ, right? So, so, um, I think that there's there's room for refinement, and that, that was certainly discussed. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing is the standard for approval is a large outcomes trial in cardiovascular risk assessment. And so the challenge is when you go to a biomarker that defines a certain population in a smaller group, <coughs> you have a standard for approval with a non-clinical endpoint at this point. I think that's part of the challenge. So there just hasn't been as much movement in that regard because if you did define a subpopulation and you still have to do a large outcomes trial, Doing those is just untenable in that regard. So I think there's a different burden of uh, regulatory approval in that regard that has driven some of this. Um, I, I know the, the focus of this talk is cardiovascular drug development. Do you think that part of um, the, the data that you show reflect the fact that um, cardiovascular device development has been so successful over the last 10 years and has a very different regulatory pathway? Um, than, than drugs, that if you're sort of outside um, outside investor, hedge fund investor, et cetera, and you sort of had X amount of dollars to spend on cardiovascular disease um, therapies, that perhaps um, devices would be a little, you know, it, it, it would be sort of a, a different game um, and perhaps one with a higher return on investment. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I, it's, you know, there wasn't much discussion about, you know, we had uh, uh, Bram Zuckerman from the FDA, who's the head of devices at our meeting, but there wasn't specific discussion on how devices themselves have maybe taken away from investment. 
Um, but even if you account for devices, I think it's pretty clear that you know investment is, is moving away towards the, you know towards oncology and other other therapeutic areas. But if you look, I mean, the New York Times highlighted this week. Um, actually, it's a good article to focus stick at um, my interventional colleagues because um, it simply said that the device um, the evidence behind devices for for tural disease is zero, um, but yet they're approved, and so uh, there's they're shiny. Huh? You're shiny. <laughs> so there, there's a little tension there in terms of like various market, um, which are lower in devices. The other side is life cycle development, which is. Hey, Matt, we can't hear him. I'm sorry. Uh, what Avery was saying was there was a recent New York Times article about uh, uh, devices, and there's actually no evidence behind approved devices. Uh, I said some. <laughs> <laughs> We painted like a downward forecast, but there were a number of companies there who presented their approach to drug development. And it was uplifting. I mean, there are companies that are reinvesting in cardiovascular disease. There are companies that are coming into it from other areas, from oncology to cardiovascular disease, like Amgen. And uh, a number of these companies made presentations that are actually really forward thinking. And, you know, you feel there's hope for the future because we have really bright people leading new programs of discovery. And their way they're looking for new molecular targets is quite different than they've done in the past. And so I was uplifted by that, which is some presentations towards the end of the meeting. So we have to remember that, you know, there, there have been failures. There are people that are still willing to go there. We need to partner with them and others and help figure this out. But we can't keep doing things the way they've been done in the past. I mean, we like to be transformative. Um, our mission is all about that. We have a number of projects that are going on right now that are pushing the envelope and will soon really bust open the envelope, I hope. But um, the key here is um, we hope to help be the key, one of the key academic interfaces. And all the academic participants, I think, felt the same way at this meeting. Um, and uh, I think through these types of presentations and working with all of our colleagues here at the DCR and other places, we can help make a difference. And we need to, we need to be the ones out there pushing these new concepts, trying new things, helping to, to, to move this along such that the people who are funding these programs see that there is a viable pathway, and uh, we can bring things that can help our patients. Well, I, I mean, I think this has been a great research conference. I appreciate the great attendance and the, the interaction. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, hopefully the paper will be published soon so you can see that in press, and uh, we look forward to any one-on-one -on -one discussions you'd like to have about the topic. Thanks. 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 Yeah.